Hello and welcome to the extended battle cruisers. Now, originally when I was going to do this, it was going to be a free parter, so free shorter videos. The trouble is I keep repeating myself and I don't like that. I don't like videos where you can t uh, tune into them, watch the first one, and then the next video, there's about five minutes overlap with the first one. And in the third video, there's five minutes overlap with the first one, five minutes overlap with the second one. And it, therefore, it's me repeating myself. So I'm doing this all as one video. It's going to be slightly longer, but I'm going to make sure there are sections dividing into the three parts. So you can watch one part, go away, come back, watch the second part, go away, come back, watch the third part. Hopefully you'll see some of the adverts joining it. It does really help with the little pen of the pennies. Thank you again to everyone who is a subscriber to my channel. Thank you to everyone who likes the videos on my channel. Thank you to everyone who watches the videos on my channel, even if you don't like them. Although I'm not sure why you watch them if you don't like them, but perhaps you still find them useful. In which case, that's a win as far as uh, the lecture in me is concerned. Thank you to everyone who presses the little tick down there and the little bell. You know, it's always nice to uh, have people there when I go live. And I hope you've, if you haven't watched the first part of this, video series, i.e. the original Battle Cruisers episode, please do go and watch it. It's one of the most popular videos I've ever put out, but I think you'll find it interesting. But this will, uh, this video has been so constructed. In fact, this whole first part is basically so if you haven't watched it, you can choose when you go and watch it. You can watch this video will explain everything as it goes. Now, the definition, as I discussed in the previous uh, previous episode, are, is this. As theorized, the definition of a battle cruiser was that it was the supreme version of the cruiser type. It was, as a battleship was to battle, a battle cruiser was to economic warfare. That is, both the sword and shield of tray. It, it was supposed to be able to choose its battles. I run away from any battleships it's going to engage, I anything that it can't beat in the, in the fight, uh, but annihilate anything it chooses not to run away from. The reality was they became the dashing cavalry, the reconnaissance force, the beauty. And they did manage to get da dashed around the world and have the Battle of the Falklands and a fair number of battles because the battle fleets people tried to avoid getting into fights, especially if you're the German high seas fleet. The, that often means that the battle cruiser forces, the reconnaissance groups, scouting groups, tend to actually end up in conflict. They also split the arms race because if I'm building a battle cruiser, that suggests I'm going off economic warfare. If I'm building a battleship, that suggests I'm fighting for control of the sea. I need control of the sea to be able to wage proper economic warfare. But if I have control of the sea, but I cannot wage economic warfare because the enemy surface raiders can get outrun my battle fleet, the and um, I either have to dissipate my battle fleet everywhere to defend anything, in which case it's not concentrated, the enemy small battle fleet can wipe it out, or I have to have something which can do that job for me. So you need both. You know, it, 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 they are not really separate. And actually, traditionally, cruisers were often bigger than battleships because they were supposed to be long range, faster, all sorts of things to do with the cruising nature of what their part, the warfare they fight. This leads us to the spectrum, and I discussed this in the first video, and I'm going to explain this again now. This video is deaf. Uh, this is video is sort of about the generation of unbuilt battle cruisers. I'm looking at. The ones which were still in construction during World War One, and the ones which came immediately afterwards. I'm not going to look at the ones later in the 1920s and 30s because I think they're worthy of a separate video because that's when the battle cruiser is entering another phase of its life, and really it's sort of an interesting thing in that you're going fast battleship, or you're going battle cruiser, or you're going some sort of hybrid. It's it's an interesting thing to look at as a separate thing. The question about where a battle cruiser falls on the spectrum, and please do note there is a gap between my battle and my cruiser for a reason. When I talk about them, I prefer to think of them as a battle cruiser, set as separate words rather than one word, and there is a reason for this. 
because these ships can be built on the battle end of the spectrum or the cruiser end of the spectrum, but they're on a spectrum between a battleship and a cruiser. They are defined, though, by the same armor, speed, firepower, and triangle as battleships, i.e., in terms of battleship, if you put it dead center of that triangle, it's going to be fairly good. But it's always going to be falling prey to the top trumps, i.e., other battleships will be faster than it. They'll be able to get away from it, but they might not have the same level of armor and firepower. Other battleships might have more firepower than it, but they might not be able to catch it up because it could be faster and it might have more armor. Other uh, ship, battleships might have more armor, but it might have better firepower and be faster. The thing is, that's a triangle, and your balancing on that triangle depends on your perspective of what your battle fleet's going to do. Are you thinking your battle fleet is going to be contesting for sea control at long range from home? This will change what you're building into it. And it's the same with battle cruisers. Are my battle cruisers existing to fight other battle cruisers? As are they existing as an extension of my battle fleet? Or are they existing as an extension of my economic warfare aims? This is going to change how I design my battle cruisers. A nation which has many battleships but needs lots of cruisers may well concentrate on speed and firepower side of the spectrum. A nation with few battleships will potentially emphasize armor much more. There is a classic example, of course, this there is Germany and Britain. If you look at the British battle cruisers versus the German battle cruisers, the British battle cruisers tend to emphasize firepower and speed. The German ones tend to em emphasize armor more. And there is a reason for this. The Germans have less dreadnoughts overall, so they are more likely to have to require their battle cruisers to su uh, support their battle fleet, whereas the British tend to have a battle fleet which is more than strong enough on its own without needing its battle cruisers to come in and save itself. That, though, is where the real problem lies, and where the portion of the debate lies, as whilst the battleship level main armed battle cruiser easily separates them from the heaviest heavy cruiser, and this can be got into later when we're talking about the Alaska class in a future video, the point is a battle cruiser will have the same level of weaponry as the equivalent battleship produced at the time. So the point you have to ask with the Alaska class is, are any battleships being built at this time armed with that weaponry? If not, then what you're dealing with is a very heavy cruiser, a large heavy cruiser, maybe a return to an armoured cruiser type, or some sort of intermediary, in which case it would be an armoured cruiser. But that's for another debate. A battle cruiser which sacrifices speed for armour, well, they can very quickly become a battleship, as I talked about in the previous video with the Congo class. They become battleships because they sacrifice speed for armor. And unfortunately, though, they don't become strong enough battleships, because they're not really proper battleships. Furthermore, there is the internal structure, and this is why I say not really proper battleships, because a battleship has far more honeycomb, far more subdivision than a battle cruiser. Basically, a battle cruiser will have a cruiser-style subdivisions i.e. there is actually more space. And there is a reason for this. It is to reduce weight in the hull. It is to allow the ship to be faster going through the water. It is to increase the power to weight ratio, because that displacement does matter. So all these things have a bearing. Which is why it's interesting when you start to look at the designs which are coming out towards the end of World War I. Now, the thing is, I can't properly evaluate the designs without having a baseline, can I? And luckily enough, there is one which is coming out, which is part built and part not built at this time. And that's the Admiral class. So they provide us a baseline because... This, of course, beauty is HMS Hood. HMS Hood is the top of the line battle cruiser that comes out of World War I. You can say differently, but in terms of ships actually built, 
I'm not talking about designs because honestly on designs, I will be, as I go through them, I will be telling you there are parts of designs which I would have preferred to have nicked. And if I'd been the Amorty, I would have nicked shamelessly from some others. But the Admiral class are rather cute. Or rather, HMS Hood is. She is... Forty seven thousand four hundred and thirty tons in deep load. Standard usually was a bit of a debate. Length eight hundred and sixty feet, seven inches, or two hundred and sixty two point three meters. Beam mm, thirty one point eight meters or a hundred and four feet slash two inches. Draft of thirty two feet or nine point eight meters. She has 24 Yarrow small tube boilers, driving four brown curders, single reduction geared steam turbines, each powering one of four shafts, for a total of 144,000 shaft horsepower, giving her a top speed of 32 knots and a range of 5,332 nautical miles at 20 knots. She had a complement of 1,433. She is armed with eight 15 inch guns in four twin turrets, 12 single 5.5 inch guns open, four single 4 inch AA guns, and six 21 inch torpedo tubes. She has a 12 inch belt. She has deck armor of between three quarters and three inches. Barbettes. Between 12 and 5 inches of armor. Turrets, 15 to 11 inches of armor. Conning tower, 11 inches to 9 inches of armor. And bulkheads, 4 to 5 inches thick. She is a battle cruiser. There is no debate. She is a battle cruiser. That's what she's built as. That should be defined as. I know we can say of her as the first of the fast battleships, and there are lots of lines which go into there. But her hull design, her subdivision, she is a battle cruiser. Um, yeah, on that hull, on that idea, you could make an excellent fast battleship. Do not get me wrong. With that profile, you could really do something. But she's a battle cruiser. And actually, I would say, despite perhaps lessons of World War Two, or maybe because of World War, uh, no, despite lessons of World War One, or maybe actually because of lessons of World War One, I would actually say she's on the cruiser end of the spectrum. Because for the British, economic warfare matters. And by 1916, 1917, well. The Royal Navy is starting to think about post World War One. That sounds strange, probably to say this. But you're in the middle of fighting a war. You're thinking about the next. You're thinking about what's going to come next. Well, the Royal Navy has been through several big wars in its history. It knows what comes after a big war. You get a funding cut. You lose things. You can no longer get projects built. You take years to get anything done while you digest lessons and persuade politicians you actually need to build some more after just spent a lot on a war. This is a navy which is cramming through C-class cruisers as fast as it can go. D-class, E-class cruisers. Vessels which it knows will not be able to be delivered in time for World War One, because it's not going to last that long. They know their own projections. They know that how they're grinding down the Germans, the Central Powers. They know what's happening. Yes, we can go. Well, it's nineteen sixteen. That's nineteen seventeen, nineteen eighteen. 
that's a, that's a long way away. This is halfway through a war, through the war. Yes, it is. You're right. But that's not saying the Royal Navy is not thinking about the future. They are. The Admiral class are ordered because of this. The Admiral class are ordered on the basis of, oh, yes, can't you see these ships the Germans are building? But we know at this point the Germans can't supply those ships. They can't build them. They're giving projections for their capabilities, which they know they can't achieve. Why? Because they know what coal supplies Germany's getting. The Royal Navy is in charge of blockading Germany. That's their primary role at this point. Yes, they're securing the seas. Yes, they're, they've got the Grand Fleet to fight uh, the High Seas Fleet should they come out. But that's all part of maintaining sea control to carry out a blockade to strangle Germany. In other words, they are making a very thorough investigation of everything Germany is getting. They are incredibly obsessed with it. So, if anyone has an idea about how long Germany's got left, about how many supplies, about the reality of their situation and what they can build, it's the Royal Navy. And so when they're building the Admiral class, these ships, these lovely ships with a range of seven and a half thousand nautical miles at 14 knots, or as earlier, 5,000. Fire 332 nautical miles at 20 knots. This is a long range ship. This is a powerful ship. This is not a ship being built to fight in the North Sea, is it? You don't need 7,000 miles of nautical, uh, 7,500 nautical miles of range to fight in the North Sea. It's 8,000 nautical miles. To the Falkland Islands. She can get there at 14 knots. Or she could do one stop somewhere to coal and then get there with plenty of coal to do something. And coal is another station long. She's a global ship. You can also point out that the Royal Navy is building a global ship because they always build global ships because they always have to think ahead about a capital ship and its investment. Yes. And you can also quite legitimately make the argument that the other three admirals are delayed while they are pushing through building of destroyers and merchant ships as a result of the submarine war. Correct. But they don't stop building Hood. They keep her going and they build her. Again, never bank against the fact that you could be facing a realist in the Admiralty. Getting the whole class, that's difficult. You've got BT shouting and hollering. You've got Jellico shouting and hollering for more battle cruisers. And because they're shouting and hollering, the cabinet gives them one because they want to make them keep quiet. They want to buy them off. If they hadn't shouted and hollered for them, they wouldn't have got any. The cabinet would have quite happily cancelled the lot because at that point the cabinet is thinking about fighting the war in front of them, not about the future. The Royal Navy's thinking about the future. Hood, yeah, 
She's a nice to have. In World War One. But she's absolutely essential. For any conflict which comes after. So what have we got coming up this week? We have made a fourth. Everything wrong with Star Wars fleets from a naval historian's perspective. I expect to get overwhelmed. But there's the point. I'm putting the, doing that on the 20th of May. On the 21st of May, I go off on my research week. So, I'll far away when people are commenting. I will deal with them all when I get back. Hence, the next live is the 3rd of June. Discord, suggestion from AdFab, Coastal Command in the 1920s and 1930s. And the next brew ships is brew ships 49, Age of Iron on the 6th of June. Long patrols. Well, we have the 22nd to 29th of May. Dreadnoughts from around the world, 1905 to 1914. And then in the 1st of June, monitors of the Royal Navy, Section 5. It's going to be fun. Anyway. Take two of an old favourite, World War One construction. So, what was going on in World War One? Well, I've got the Borodino class here. They're being built. They are the Russian battle cruisers. Or are they? You decide. Are they battle cruisers? They're called battle cruisers. They buy them as battle cruisers, but let's consider it. Displacement, 33,000 tonnes. Length, 223.85 meters. Power. Let's get into the where there's a problem. So she has 25 Yarrow boilers. This compares to Queen of Mary, which was built, ordered, and 19, it was start, laid down in 1911. So the Borodin class are laid down a year later. And this is all prior to World War I. So there isn't the problems you'd think there. And She's got 20, uh, the Borodinos have 25 Yarrow boilers, supplying four shafts by four turbines, and Queen Mary had 42. Powering two Parsons direct drive steam turbines. <whistles> the lovely Borodinos managed to get 66,000 shaft horsepower, which is good, suggesting they're using fairly decent boilers. But the lighter Queen Mary, because Queen Mary is cute, but, well, she in deep load is uh, 32,000 tons, so 5,000 tons less. She generates 75,000 shaft horsepower. The Borodinos have a top speed of 26 and a half knots. They are built in the same year as the Queen Elizabeth class battleships. That's the same year they're sort of laid down in. There are also the Iron Dukes. The Iron Dukes, they had a top speed of 21 and a quarter knots, so yeah, she could pull away from them. But the Queen Elizabeth's. 24 knots. Mmm. Well, they have two knots, providing everything's working fine and they're, all, they're getting good coal and everything's going to plan, but that's not much safety, to, uh, safety gap. They're also, they're armed with 12 14 inch guns. Now that is good. The 14 inch guns are good. Let's be honest. The Iron Dukes at the time have 13 and a half inch guns. 10 of them, but 13 and a half inch guns. So this is good. It's got 12. And the Queen Elizabeth class have 8 15 inch guns. And Queen Mary herself has. Eight, 13 and a half inch guns. So, in armament, definitely, she's got very good guns. She's got 24 single 130 millimeter guns. Oh, that's 5.1 inches. Uh, four single 
2.64mm AA guns. Again, being ordered in 1912 with AA guns. That's fairly advanced. And six 450mm torpedo tubes. Cool. Here is where things start to get really quite interesting. Because her belt is thicker than Queen Mary's. By a little bit. Barbettes, bulkheads, they're about the same. Is she a battle cruiser, though? I would say, considering the conservative nature of her speed at the time, when you consider battle cruisers at this point are being designed for 28, 20, uh, sometimes trying to go faster than 28 knots, and she's 26 knots. Yes, she can outpace most battleships comfortably. But in the same year, there is a battleship ordered which, no, she can't, uh, she can't comfortably. She can outpace her, but not comfortably. And considering the firepower of 15-inch guns, I would say, therefore, what you are looking at in more cases than a battle cruiser is a fast battleship in terms of its idea. I would say this vessel, especially with its armour, it's gone on the armour firepower spectrum. Having 12 guns, that's amazing, but that's a lot of weight. So they've emphasised firepower, they've got average to slightly better armour for a battle cruiser at the time, and they've got less speed. They're heading towards fast battleship, battleship territory. The Mackinson class. I'm sorry, I, 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 there are German battle cruisers I have affection for, and there are German battle cruisers which I, for some reason, don't. Mackinson class is one of these. I don't think I need to expand it fully, really, to see. Displacement, full load, 35,000 tons. So, at full load, they're 10,000 tons lighter than an Admiral class. 32 boilers. Well, that's good. That's a lot of power. 88,769 shaft horsepower is what they're aiming for. Well, to be fair to them, they are ordered earlier. They are an advanced version of the Deflinger in many ways. But. For a ship that is laid down. In 1914. That seems, especially for a battle cruiser, that seems lacking in ambition, considering the amount of power you've got potentially generated. You have 32 boilers, and this is laid down and theorized before you have the problems of coal supply. So come on, come on, Germany, you've got it in you. Top speed of 28 knots, and range of 8,000 nautical miles at 14 knots. That's good. That is a commerce warfare vessel. Outpaces, outranges 
hood. That is a good thing. Complement 46 officers and 1,114 enlisted men. Eight 13.8 inch guns. Okay. I know there's a delay in the construction. But again, this is laid down in 1914. HMS Queen Elizabeth has been laid down in 1912. It's been known that she has 15 inch guns coming for her for a long time by the time this one is laid, this vessel's laid down. Now, you can say yes, her point is she has the speed to outpace a Queen Elizabeth class. But there were also rumours about Argencourt being able to reach 28 knots going around this time. And there are other stuff I will get into Argencourt in discussing when we get uh, when I'm on the Dreadnoughts uh, paper. So the point is. This is a design which the Germans are working on throughout World War One. It's used as the bogeyman to justify the Admiral class. It's used for many, many reasons, and yet... I suppose what I don't like about it is the Germans are faced with a choice. The Royal Navy keeps upping the game. They first upped the game with the Dreadnought. Then came the Invincible class battlecruisers, which upped it speed-wise, so and split the game. Then they upped it with the Orion class, with 13 and a half inch guns, the first, what were called at the time, Super Dreadnoughts. Then everyone else built bigger. Then they upped it again with the Queen Elizabeth class. And then they up the numbers. And the response from Germany gets more and more. How do I put this? More and more stale. They, it's as if they know we can't win this. So we're not really trying. We're just going to keep regurgitating the same formula. With a bit more flashier paint. Which is kind of strange because then... This class I should be really, really annoyed with. But actually, considering... They aren't that much different. They're 38,000 tons in full load. But I'm not. I still do not know to this day, and I've le I, I left that as a note to myself and forgot to move it, why they have 47 officers rather than 46. Uh, it's a case of... Go up 40 enlisted personnel and we need an extra officer? Why? Why one more officer? You've got a ship which isn't that much different. But it is different. They have 90,000 shaft horsepower. They have 32 boilers again. but And they have a reduced top speed of 27.3 knots. And this I see as the Germans admitting with the Erzak York class that actually what they're going to do is going to go the bat fast battleship way. Because my main problem with the Mackinson class is that they make sense and make sense only in terms of battle cruisers is if you consider them expendable. 
I consider them not expendable. They are too much close. Uh, they are too close to battleships. They are too large for Germany. They're not expendable. So if you can't have them out, like you'll have Scharnhorst and Neisenau in the Battle of the Falklands with Admiral the Gra Gra Spey, Admiral Spey. Then you shouldn't be building them. You should be building battleships. You should be fighting for control of the sea. Fast battleships make sense for Germany. Fast battleships really do. And this is what I feel the Ozat York class is, really is. Because for Germany, building a fast battleship, i.e. perhaps a little bit less armor, but a little bit more speed. So it's faster than any normal battleship. Not as fast as your battle cruiser, but too well armed and too he too well armed and too much firepower for a battle cruiser to muck around with. Fast enough that a battleship w uh, that most battleships won't be able to keep up with you. That makes sense, and I would argue that the Ozat York, especially, is heading towards the battleship end of the spectrum of the battle cruiser, and is heading towards a fast battleship. And it makes sense. It. It makes far more sense for the German scenario in World War One. It makes far more sense for the German scenario in World War Two, which is why I like Scharnhorst and Neisenau far better than Bismarck and Tirpitz, because I think Scharnhorst and Neisenau are, especially if they'd been, if they'd built more of the same class and they'd given them, I don't know, fifteen had given them fifteen-inch guns and or managed to give them a decent, a slightly bigger gun from the get-go, they would have been a really useful asset because. Fast battleships, i.e. battleships which lose a little bit in armor and lose a little bit in firepower, I have 15-inch rather than 16-inch guns to save a bit of weight, have slightly thinner armor but not that much thinner, just to shave off the weight a little bit to put a little bit more horsepower in, a little bit more, maybe a little bit longer so they can have, they can, their hull can be slightly narrower, longitudinal strengthening then becomes a factor, but you know, you can do that. That makes sense from a German perspective. I designing a ship which is faster than the battleships it might come across, but more powerful and have more firepower than the battle cruisers it's going to, it would run into. Because that would make the British have to dance to your tune. Instead, the Germans are constantly being dancing to the British tune. That's what the British are doing to them all the time. The British are basically going, yeah, yeah. <sighs> You're trying to build that. Yeah, we're now going to build this. It shouldn't have been the British which built the first super dreadnought, as in the Orions. It shouldn't have been the British who didn't go and double down with the Queen Elizabeth class. It should have been the Germans if they really wanted to be in a naval race. But they don't. But they are, uh, before I go, this is a nice ship. Again, it's 15 inch guns. That makes sense to me for them. I, I, there are lots of reasons I can think of that I should not like this class, but I'd like the years at your class. And I don't like the Mackinsons. And that's my opinions. I know people are going to disagree with me. I don't, you know, I, 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 that's the great thing about history. You can disagree quite happily. But the point is, the reason I don't like the Mackersons goes back to that battle cruiser, battle, uh, battleship, battle uh, cruiser spectrum of the battle cruiser. I think for the German situation, these are trying to be too middle of the road. Go back to the spectrum. They are trying to sort of hit right here in the center. And the British with their battle cruisers are quite honestly are heading towards this end. And I think the Ezra York is heading towards this end. And this makes sense. The Germans keep trying to sort of wander between. Oh, uh, we, we, we feel like we should be down this end, but, you know, we, really, strategically, we need to be this end. And they keep ending up dead in the middle, which means they're not 
they're lovely middle of the road and I can use them as examples when teaching and I do I go this is your middle of the road design and then I go what's it built for and the thing is if you're going middle of the road you're building a good all-rounder but does Germany need a good all-rounder Germany either needs a cheap and cheerful commerce raider that it doesn't mind losing which if you want to build a battle cruiser for that in your Germany, then go right down the end, strip off the armor, try and get something which is 40 knots and long range, and say goodbye to everyone. That would be the sense. And does it really need anything more than 12 inch guns? Because it's not a, the only thing it can catch it, it would potentially be little cruisers, which can blast away at. You probably wouldn't get to 40 knots in the technology at the time, but you could certainly get far, clay, that's what we'd be aiming for. But the moment you start going, oh no, we have to have armor to take firepower, this firepower, etc., you're starting to push up here. And you're starting to lose the speed, and you're starting to lose. And when you've got the fact that the British are level pegging or faster than you in terms of battle cruisers, then just admit you're not building a battle cruiser, you're building more battleships. But you're calling them battle cruisers, and that undermines them. Build fast battleships. It, they actually suit, and you could concentrate everything in one type of ship. <sighs> Anything else we got coming up before I quickly change to, uh, change into the next one? Uh, let's see. Age of Empires. That's not going to be the games, sadly. I might do a games brew ships at some point. Um, 8th of June, to close blockade or distant blockade? Yes, the, the battle cruiser theme might be something I'm working with a lot at the moment. The economic warfare theme, the battle cruiser theme, might be something that's coming back to a lot. Right then, post World War One construction. At the 42 minute mark. So we have the Margis. I like these ones, they're cute. Range of 8,000 nautical miles at 14 knots. There's a reason for that. 14 knots is a fairly decent, you know, requirement. But they're using 19 small tube water boilers um, supplying four steam turbines, which gives them 131,200 shaft horsepower. Woohoo! That means these are definitely in the range of your Admiral class. This is going to be cool. 47,000 tons fully loaded. Whew. Yeah. That's up there. That's going to be a big ship. That's bigger than the Admiral class. Complement 1,600 personnel. 10 16-inch guns. Yowza. And what's really good about that is if you want to upgrade in future, you can remove one of those 16-inch guns and you have a lot of weight to play one of those 16-inch turrets and you have a lot of weight to play with. 16 uh, 5.5-inch guns. 6 4.7-inch guns for AA work and 8 24-inch torpedoes. Again with the torpedoes, why? Honestly, if your battle cruiser is in a sort of place where it's torpedoing the enemy, you have a problem. These things, they're massive. They've got their 16-inch guns. If anything's getting in the range of your 16-inch guns that requires a torpedo to take it out, you have done something wrong. You have got a lot going wrong that day. Whereas, with having the big torpedo flat, to house your torpedoes, you put a great big space in your ship which can flood. And if you were building a battle cruiser, which this most certainly was, a lovely one, but a battle cruiser, then perhaps don't. I'm sorry, torpedoes in battle cruisers, torpedoes in battleships, full stop, are things I am not that appreciative of. They sound good, in theory. They do sound good, in theory. 
And I suppose if you eventually end up developing a long lance torpedo and it could take it. Which 24 inch torpedo? Yeah, it could do. There are advantages, perhaps, especially in night actions. But. Just think of what you could use that weight in space for. Other than torpedoes. That's useful. But nice class. Now, this is where I get into trouble with some of my colleagues. Because I love the Lexington class. They are some of the, mo the, some of the best ideas of battle cruisers. And honestly, my, this is one reason why I get annoyed with the Germans. Because we talk about the arms race and naval race as between the British and the Germans. And it certainly is in construction. But I would argue, in technological terms, it's between the Brits and the Americans and the Japanese. Specifically, the Brits and the Americans, more often than not. Because in technology terms, these are the two nations which are pushing the envelope in the Dreadnought race. It's not the Germans. The Germans turn up and go, Yes, we are building this mighty Dreadnought. It looks great on paper. And then you look and go, That's pretty darn conservative. But it is going to be built very precisely. Yes, but... This thing has turboelectric drive. Why? Because it's reliable and useful. Because despite some, the, the extra space it requires, despite all those things, it's going to allow you to get up to a lot better speed and a lot more efficient operating. Because you no longer have to let your turbines be governed by the speed your shafts have to turn at. Because the, sh the turbines and the shafts are no longer connected. Which is great, because you can spin up your turbines, get all the power and juice flowing, and then send it to your shafts. Or, alternatively, you can have one turbine spinning, be saving power, saving energy, and keep your shafts going. On a lower speed. And look at that. 180,000 shaft horsepower. Woo! Hoo! Hoo! Plus, please look at these pictures. They are cool. Seriously. The original design is the one at the bottom. Then it works up to the top with the more recent... Uh, the, 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 as the design evolves. They look good. And notice something. They have worked out the aft deck is going to be wet because of the way it's going to go through water, because of the way it's going to go through the waves. So, instead of having the aftermost turret on the, low, the, on the lowest deck, they have raised it up. They've gone, frick, it'll make our gunnery solutions easier because we'll have all our turrets on the same levels. We'll have two one level below the other two. That makes gunnery solutions a lot easier, rather than having a sort of medium level and then one below and one above, as in the hood. And it means it's dry. And let's be honest, in World War II, that would have provided so much space for AA guns. I mean, literally. These are the most useful ships for World War II, which weren't available because they were aircraft carriers and i love them as aircraft carriers they do really well as aircraft carriers but just imagine if the u.s navy in world war ii had had the lexington class battle cruisers look at that thing top speed 33 knots yowza that's faster than hood a range of 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots Mm-hmm. Eight 16 inch guns, 14 single 6 inch guns. So if I've got 14 single 6 inch guns, imagine what I can do if I turn those into 5 inch dual purpose weapons. Because I've also got 8 single 3 inch AA guns by the end. So I have 22 guns mounted throughout the thing in single mounts. 
I can turn those into dual purpose 5 inch mounts by World War II. Again with the torpedo tubes. But good armor. This is about uh, this is a battle cruiser and it's a gorgeous glorious one which isn't built. In fact, honestly, uh, I have looked and wondered Mm. And I think it would be a great thing to actually, how do I put this, when I'm looking at this sort of ship, is I'm going to have to admit, after, uh, I have plans for what I would like to do in terms of modeling some of the post-World War I fleets. And I think modeling the effect of the Lexington class, if they had become being used as battle cruisers in World War II, would be very, very interesting with the likely modification and improvements. And I think post-World War I, they're pretty darn useful for the Americans as well. It's one of the other things that's lost in the Washington Treaties. All these wonderful designs are lost. Okay, we can go that if they'd existed, we would probably have had the Amagi class as well. Because they wouldn't have become aircraft carriers. And these wouldn't have become aircraft carriers. And there is a reason why uh, battle cruisers, especially ones on the cruiser end of the spectrum, tend to be turned into aircraft carriers. They're already fast, and they're long. I have to admit, there are some interesting ideas about how the um, Admiral class would be turned into battle crew into aircraft carriers. I have looked at those, but we aren't getting into that. But no, the Lexington class battle cruiser would be a, and I say this, I'm not going to say it would be something great to play in World of Warships. Because it would be, but there's a small problem in World of Warships, and for all I enjoy about the game, the one small pro uh, one problem is the size of the maps, which they have to have because of the way governing, governing gameplay. It's no one's fault, it's the reality of computational availability at the time, and uh, what you're able to do over the internet, and it, it, there are other, it's been traded off to improve the experience in other ways. But I always think for a battle cruiser to be properly played with uh, on such a game, you need a bigger map because honestly I think and I've done some rough estimates in my on this but I haven't done much I have to admit because I'm doing so much putting I've been putting doing some work so much work over the last few weeks and marking I think you would find the battle crew of the Lexingtons if put in a proper battle cruiser scenario, a fast response economic warfare ship for a Pacific War or Atlantic War would possibly be some of the best ships ever. I really do. I really do like them. Right then. But I can't stop there, because if I'm going to look at the Lexingtons, and I'm talking about the Amagis, and I'm talking about the Admirals. I've got to also talk about the g Threes, And I know I've done a whole video on the Washington Cherry Trees, and please go look it up if you want to. But, let's consider the g Threes. So, 47 and a half thousand tons in standard. I'm not sure where my typing that came up from. So, it's um, 48,400 long tons, um, roughly 49,200 tons. That's the normal one. 
and 54,700, well, nearly 54,800 tons in deep load for the G-Freeze. So I'm sorry about that, that's wrong. My typing skills. <sighs> I can remember. I did that ages ago, no one understood at the time, so. Ow, I noticed it now. That's the important thing. Now, there is a debate over whether 856 feet works out as 260.9 meters or 261 meters. I've gone with the 261 meters because, in my experience, no ship that's been designed by Britain has ever turned out um, shorter than it was supposed to be. A few have turned out longer. And 160 feet is roughly 32 meters. Four shaft geared turbines. So that's the turbines geared, but they're on they're geared turbines, but they're attached directly to the shaft. So it's not the turbo electric system. Deploying 160,000 shaft horsepower. So I'm sorry, but the Lexington class have you beat 31 to 32 knots, armed with nine 16 inch guns. Eight 16 inch guns in the Lexington class, so they have an extra gun, that's always nice. Um, yeah, here's my big problem with them they look like that. Now, the forward gun and the all set concentrated gun battery idea is certainly something which gets a lot of attention at the end of World War One, in the beginning of the inter uh, uh, sort of throughout the interwar period, but it's rarely actually built. And the reason it's rarely actually built is because it pretty much assumes you can always control which direction your enemy is coming from. Now, in this case, the ship design has been carefully constructed to provide them with as wide a field aft as possible. But they have no, gu no main battery guns able to fire directly aft. They do have lots of secondary turrets which can engage directly aft. Lots and lots of firepower like that. And the, I know the Nelson, Rodney, the French Dunkirks, all these ships are built with their, forward, their guns forward batteries. But there's a reason King George V class aren't. There is a reason Vanguard isn't. There is a reason the Iowas aren't. There is a reason the South Dakotas aren't. There is a reason the successors of the French designs aren't. There is a reason Bismarck, Tirpitz, Scharnhorst. There is a reason the Littorios aren't. Basically, what you save in terms of weight and in terms of machinery for want of a better phrase and the layout you can you can achieve with it you lose in terms of operational capability, i.e., if I have a G3, it had better get not get caught in a stern chase. It had better not be in a situation where it has to run away, because it can only do so while zigzagging, which means the enemy can catch up with it. Now. That might all sound academic. That might even be going, well, the, the naval theorists at the time are putting this forward. They, they surely know best than you, Dr. Clark, or Alex, as I call myself. Well, they do and they don't. 
they are working out how to get the maximum firepower, and the minimum cost, and the maximum armor within the limits of the time they are dealing with. And based on the context of the time. I would argue very strongly that whilst I would, if you're going to go with the nine in three treble turrets, and you've already got quite a significant armor profile aft, it's better to have a single turret aft and two turrets forward because then you at least have something covering your rear and honestly it doesn't affect your broadside and if you d can structure your ship as much as you have done already in this design to give that the field of fire it has you can structure it so that the forward and aft guns have a significant ability to support each other in terms of firing forward and in terms of firing aft because that third turret cannot fire forward. Okay? If this was a ship which was all based around two turrets and both were mounted forward, as in some of the French vessels, I can understand and accept that because we're basing it on eight guns in two quadruple turrets, all forward. Yeah. You're doing that to save costs. But the moment you have already put in the weight and the issues of a third turret and i know it will affect your arrangement of machinery it will affect your spacing of engine rooms of shafts but if you're already going to have the third main turret you might as well have your rear covered and it's my big problem the g3s i think they are a lovely theoretical design but I would not have liked to see them built in practice. Now, if someone wanted to build more Admiral class, more hoods, yeah, that's fine. Go with that. Could have gunned them to 16 inch guns. Not too much work to up gun from a 15 to a 16 inch. There's a bit of work, but on a design already like that, you could do it. Could have converted some of them to aircraft carriers. That would have been quite nice. I have a feeling they would have had an end-to-end -end flight deck, though. And I have a reason for that. Um, which probably sounds strange, but here is it is. If they are my fast, large carriers, the Royal Navy is already looking at the concept of a strike carrier. HMS Eagle, HMS Hermes are all built with end-to-end -end decks. The reason Courageous and Glorious and Furious get the little flying off decks um, forward is for fighters, for fighter defense of the fleet. But that's designed with the idea already that only fighters can really take off from there. And whilst it allows rapid launch of fighters, it actually interferes with your ability to launch and operate your strike aircraft and a larger carrier is going to be a strike orientated carrier and an admiral class would have been a larger carrier it would also give them a larger hangar for more strike aircraft and considering the royal navy's obsession with torpedo bombers right from the beginning when it came to their aircraft and everything that would have been critical so i have a feeling they would have had end-to-end -end flight decks Make of that what you will, though. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I'm sorry this has been a long patrol of an hour rather than three mm, 25 minute episodes, but I wanted to do an extension of the Battle Cruisers. I wanted to look at their concepts and I wanted to not repeat myself for you. Finally, where does the G3 end on our spectrum?
Honestly, they end up in the Commerce Raid round, I mean, the Cruise round. You can see that from their division when you look at them. When you look at this design. That's very much Cruiser subdivision. You can also see that from the perspective of their weapons choice. And it's my big problems with the battleships because, well, the N3 is, again, if you're a battleship, having all your guns orientated so... It only works if you are presuming all your fights are going to be inline fights a la Jutland, where you're going to have a lot of ships together. And the fact that you know, that we all know that a Royal Navy writings at the end of World War I are focusing again and again on the fact that they don't think there will be another Jutland, that refighting Jutland isn't really the case, that what you're looking at is engagements like Dogger Bank, which are very fast actions, or the Falkland Islands. They're looking at more task force style engagements rather than mass fleet engagements. Concentrating your firepower so that you have an aspect of your ship which cannot have the protection of main gun fire when guns are your principal weapons i.e. this is before the carriers have really come in as your versatile strike aircraft and uh, battleships are not your lead escort slash amphibious warfare support slash if necessary annihilators of any enemy who gets through is a bad design choice in my mind but I don't agree uh, the the idea that G3s are fast battleships. I would say they are battle cruisers on the economic way. I'd say their similarities with the N threes come down to the fact that both are designed to try and use minimality in terms of they're supposed to be using the maximum lessons to gain from World War One, but the minimum costs, the minimum amount of armor, the minimum amount of difficulty in construction, in order to try and make them attractive to governments who don't want to spend money. And I'd argue that has an overrider on their, their development. <laughs> I've said enough already about what's coming, so I hope you enjoyed the videos that are coming. I am going to put the Patron choice votes live shortly. I did mean to put it up on the weekend, but I got delayed because there was a thunderstorm. And um, thank you. Have a nice evening. And sorry this is late today. Uh, I'm recording it, then I'm going to be doing teaching, and then it's pro uh, well, YouTube works as magic, and then it'll go live. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day, and take care.